Long time ago, I grew up in the Atlantic City area. I grew up around all the gangsters of the era in the late 70s, early 80s. You know, I've re I revolved around the, the, the sun 47, almost 48 times now, and I've learned a thing or two. But even growing up in that era, I knew these guys were some serious guys, and they did some bad stuff. And you kind of got an idea that they were, they were up to no good, but you were just a kid. You know, I was friends with all their sons. I, I hung out on George Avenue in Atlantic City. And you, you find out real quick that you better respect these guys. They command it. But what I realized is, although they were bad guys, the worst guy was the guy that I went home to every night. And he wasn't a gangster. That was, that was, he was my father. And he, there's, there's something to be said about physical abuse versus emotional abuse. I can take a punch. You know, I'm a pretty tough guy, but emotional abuse, especially when you're a kid, takes a toll on you and you really don't know how to deal with it. You, you know, you get hit in sports or, or something like that and you're fine. You know, you walk it off. We're, ta we're taught as young boys to walk it off or rub some dirt on it. But how do you do that with an emotional scar? So although my father hit me quite frequently, uh, the emotional abuse that he put me through was probably the worst. Uh, my father was a little racist. He used to call me the laziest white man alive, which I still to this day don't understand because I have friends of all different races and there's lazy ones in every, every corner of the, the globe. Make you feel really bad in sports if you did something wrong. Really beat your character down. And you always feel like you have this, this monster on your back, this thing that you're trying to run away from. And, and you try to develop a new identity. You figure, if, if I become this, then everything at home will be okay. It's not necessarily so. So, you know, you're growing up and you think, okay, maybe if I'm the tough kid, that'll do it. Maybe that's going to do it. Well, you become the tough kid and you get into a lot of fights. And does it do it? Nope. Nope. So, you know what, maybe I'll be the smart kid. That'll do it. That's what everybody wants. That's what everybody wants to me. You're constantly searching for this identity. Nope, doesn't do it. Then you go on to drugs and you go on to petty theft. You know, my, my, most of my friends growing up were, were thieves, breaking into houses, breaking into cars, stealing everything that wasn't nailed down. But maybe if I stole enough, I, I'd be able to fill this, this hole that was created by such a toxic home environment. And, you know, when you, when you try to fill, stuff something in that hole inside of you, and you realize that doesn't do it, you move on to the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. Uh, when things got tough and that's not your true identity, what do you do? You run away from things. Time moves on, I, I grow up and I had the opportunity to go to college. I was a pretty bright kid. And I go away and I pick a college that was two and a half hours away. It was the furthest college at the time that, would it, that, that accepted me. And I, I jumped on it. I just wanted to leave this, this life behind. I didn't, I didn't want to be a thief. I saw some of my friends already starting to go to jail and getting arrested for petty stuff. Um, my home life was very toxic. My father, very, just not a nice guy, not a nice guy. So I run away. I run away to college because when you, when you run away to a different area, you get the opportunity that very few of us are given. That's to reinvent yourself, to, to really make something out of nothing. You can create a whole new persona. They're going to believe exactly what you tell them. So I go away to college and I said, you know what? I'm not going to be this guy anymore. I'm going to be somebody new. So I immerse myself in athletics. I immerse myself in the gym and I become this big bulky guy thinking, okay, now this is my identity. This is my identity. This is where I'm going to fit in. And after a while you realize, no, no. So you run away from that identity. Then you get into girls. You know, you're always into girls, but college is really when you get into girls. And this girl that I'm with, she's going to be my identity. Well, that's not true either. So you're constantly searching and searching. You get out of college. I found that I could never go back home. There was nothing for me at home anymore. I'm going to create this new life in North Jersey. Uh, South Jersey is just not for me anymore. And I really loved it. I really did love it. But I was constantly running from something. And I never understood this 
until I got a little bit older. I was trying to find myself. I was trying to find my place in this world. I, I had a feeling that I was, I was destined for something like we all are. You know, we're all, we all feel like we're destined for, for greatness. But you just got to find it. You got to find your little niche. One day I'm in, the, I'm in the gym and a guy comes up to me and, he, and we're just talking. And he says, well, you know, did you ever think about becoming a cop? I had never thought about it. My brother, you know, my brother took police tests every week trying to become a cop. That was his dream. It was never my dream. My dream was to go out and make a difference in the world. But the way it was sold to me is, hey, you're going to have a pension. You're going to have benefits. You're, gonna, you're never going to be rich, but you'll, you'll survive. You'll make a good living. And this is probably uh, early 2001. So I go, I, I take the test, and it turns out I did very well on the test. I get the job. It's very rare in the police world in New Jersey to get the job on the first, first shot out. So I was very fortunate. While I was in the police academy, 9-11 happens, and the police world changed. You know, this, this job that you thought you took, it was just a job. Uh, you, you, everything, the way you did everything changed. The way your mindset changed. One of the things about police work that I found very early on is I took it as a job. And then when I became immersed in it, because this was my new identity, I finally thought that I found my place in this world. I found out very quickly that it's more than just arresting bad guys, doing car chases, you know, locking people up. It's about keeping people safe. It's about giving people hope. It's about giving people a symbol to, to look towards when they need help and they don't know where to go. It's a, it's, it's a wonderful job. One of the stories that jumps out at me is there was, a, there was a young woman with a very young child, about four years old. The child's name was Mason. And she's ready to end her life. She has a knife with her. We go in there and she won't let anybody near the kid. She certainly won't let anybody take the kid away. And I'm able to sit there and talk to her. I broke a very important rule because there's something called the 25 foot rule that if you get close, that close to somebody with a knife, they're going to be able to stab you before you can draw your gun out and take care of things. I felt comfortable enough to do it. Since this woman was, she needed help. She really needed help. And I really felt for this little kid. I don't know what it was about what was about this little kid that, that drew me to him. So I sat on the bed next to her and I talked to her. And I'm watching this kid, Mason, go from hugging his mother to really start just nudging closer, nudging closer, and all of a sudden he's right up against me. That situation ends, we get her, get her the help that she needs, we send her off to the hospital, we, the grandmother was there, we take the kids so everybody's safe. 10 years go by and I'm in plain clothes, I'm in the, I'm in the supermarket and I hear, hey, Officer Kevin, I'm in plain clothes. I turn around and there's a 15, 16 year old kid there. And I said, yeah, that's, um, my name's Kevin, who, who, who are you? And he goes, well, I'm Mason. You helped my mom out and she's getting, she's better now. She's better now because of you. And he gave me a big hug and that's what police work was to me. And I love that job. And for a long time after that, I really felt like I had found my place and I didn't have to run away anymore like I did when I was a kid. Then July 10th, 2013 happens. We respond to a dispute at a townhouse complex. And it wasn't uncommon where I worked. I worked in a small suburban town. And we go there and we can hear the arguing. One of, my, one of the officers is in the back and I'm in the front and as we try to breach the door, pop, pop. <sighs> it's that holy shit moment. You fall back, you make sure your other officer's okay. I go back around the, the, to the rear of the building. It was in the middle section of a townhouse, so there's an exit in the back and an entrance in the front. Other officers are covering the front. And we get on this little deck. Now this guy's already shot at police once. There's no reason why he wouldn't do it again, but we see the victim in there and again, Police work is about protecting people. It's about helping people. We have to get to this victim before something really bad happens. We throw a chair through the sliding glass door and out of nowhere, I see the brightest flash I've ever seen. I hear a bang. I feel gunpowder hit my face. This guy was right behind the wall. We couldn't see him. Pulls his gun around, shoots at me. The bullet missed my ear by what they suspect is about an eighth of an inch, but I know it wiggled my left ear. I hit the ground. I have no idea whether I'm shot or not. I look down. The other officers on the deck at that time were able to get off. I look down. I see a lot of blood. 
uh, other officers were asking me if I'm shot, and I said, you know what, I, I, I don't know. I don't know. I see a lot of blood, and my shoulder hurts. But I'm trapped where I am on this deck. I can't get out. If I get out, he's going to be able to shoot. So I'm stuck. I come to the realization very quickly that I'm going to die. And if I'm going to die, you're coming with me. I get into a prone position, very calm, very clear. Think of my kids. I had a three-year-old. I had a seven-month-old. My seven-month-old will never know me. My three-year-old only have vague recollections of me. I say goodbye to him. I, uh, I wish I would be there just to kiss him goodnight one more time. And I get ready to die. I get ready to shoot it out with this guy. By the grace of God, the other officers were able to reach over top, grab my belt, cover the front door, and get me out. At this time, the, the, the assailant goes upstairs, the victim, we're able to get the victim out. That's a great job. We did our job. We protected life. Nobody got hurt, seriously. I go to the hospital, get glass removed from my arm, and the, the, the police department tells me, hey, you, you know, you, why don't you, I was working Wednesday, Thursday. He says, hey, why don't you take Thursday off? I come back Monday. I figure, great, I got a four-day vacation. It was a great job. You know, I'm amped up. I can't go to sleep. I, I sleep a little bit, but I don't really get good sleep. I wake up to 50 phone calls about what happened. That's, you know, police, police works about, it's like a big sewing circle. And everything's cool. Everything's fine. My wife is just beside herself that, you know, she can't believe what happened, but she's thankful that I'm home. So we go to the movies Thursday night. This event happened on a Wednesday. We go to the movies Thursday night and everything's fine. We're watching a comedy. It's a Seth Rogen comedy called This Is The End. And in there is a, there's a scene with a big bang. I still feel what it was like in that movie theater. My heart started racing. I started pouring sweat. Couldn't breathe. I didn't want to alert my wife because she'd been through enough. I didn't want to alert her about what, what was going on. So I just tell her, look, I'm going to go up and go to the bathroom. I, I, my stomach hurts a little bit. I go outside and I can't catch my breath. I can't stop sweating. I can't stop shaking. I've never felt anything like this before in my entire life. I can't go back into the movie theater. It's like I'm paralyzed. After about 15 minutes, she comes out and says, you know, are you okay? And I said, yeah, you know, my stomach's hurting. She wants to go back and sit down. I'll be in in a little bit. She goes, nah, let's, let's go home. Well, that night, I had about the worst nightmare I could ever have. I woke up so wet, drenched in sweat that... I actually had to check to see if I pissed myself. And then subsequently after that, every night was just nightmare after nightmare after nightmare. What I realize right now is that's the onset of, of PTS. And I want to make this very clear is it's post-traumatic stress. It's not a disorder. It's not a disorder. You weren't born with this. A disorder is something you're born with. This is a brain disease. It's a brain injury. The synapses in your brain actually become damaged because of the trauma you, you, you see. It goes on and on. We, we go down to see my parents who still lived in the Atlantic City area to bring the kids down. And my son spills chocolate milk. He's three years old. He spills chocolate milk on his, on his car seat. And I lost my mind. It was so bad on the ride home that my wife was begging me to pull over and let her and the kids out. I was this just maniac. That night I realized that there was a serious problem and I need to get some help. I try to go get some help and they send you to the doctors and you know the doctors medicate you and I, I, I was supposed to go back to work on that Monday. I was in the doctor's office because I, I had a bunch of glass in my arm and that's where the blood was coming from. I, I wasn't shot. But the, the doctor's picking glass out of my arm and I remember her asking me, she goes, are you okay? And I said, yeah, you know, it's, I'm all right. It's just, it's just a little bit of glass. It, it's not a big deal. She goes, no, that's not what I mean. Are, are you okay? I'm not a crier. You know, I've, I'm, I consider myself pretty tough. You would have thought that I lost the most important person in the world to me. I started crying and bawling in that doctor's office to where the doctor actually gave me a hug. It's very rare for a doctor to break that, that patient boundary. And she did. She gave me a hug. And I didn't know, I, I, I didn't understand these feelings. I didn't understand what the heck was going on. All I know is I wasn't right. Time moves on, the nightmares are still going, and I realize that some things have changed in me. 
thunder and lightning storms. This was July, so the thunder and lightning storms were common. And when thunder happened, I was ready to go shit my pants. I couldn't deal with it. I, I actually would go and hide in a closet when the thunder would happen. Um, I couldn't watch movies with guns. I couldn't hear any loud, like fireworks, forget it. Fireworks will send me under the covers in a closet, just hiding away. I was, I was changing. I was changing. I couldn't sleep. I was up majority of the night. And one day, my son, he's a three-year-old. He's got Nerf guns hanging around. He's playing around, points a Nerf gun at me. Well, there's a maneuver that the police will do when somebody, you're, you're taught it, when somebody's pointing a gun at you, you grab it like this real quick and then you pull it away from them. And it's a, it's a blink of an eye. You, you practice it so much, it's, it's muscle memory. I do that to him and I rip it right out of his hands. I take it, snap it in two. And I remember that look. And for people who have children, they know that blank look that that child gets. I scared the hell out of my three-year-old. Three-year-old. What did I just do? He's standing there at me with his mouth open, and I snap it into it, throw it in, the, throw it in the garbage. I don't say anything to him. I walk out of the house. Now, prior to this, I had never carried my off-duty gun off you know, when I wasn't working. I just, it's a liability. I'm not a real big fan of guns anyway, so I never carried it. But I started carrying it because I, I wasn't sleeping. I was getting paranoid. Um, the guy who shot at me, he was in custody, but he... Uh, I, you know, my, my brain was wired wrong. So I start carrying my off-duty gun. It was a little uh, Chief Special 38 nickel plated with lightning grips. Beautiful, just gorgeous gun, little five shot. After I broke the gun on my son, I just walked out of the house. I went and lived in the woods for three days. Hung out against a tree. Took my cell phone, threw it in my car, parked my car in a different section. And uh, I didn't want anybody to find me. And just thought, and I, I don't think I slept for three days because I had to get out of the house. Who are you going to talk to about this stuff? There's nobody. There's no. There's nobody who's going to understand you. Nobody's going to going to understand these 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 random thoughts going on in your head. And you're not sleeping. I started drinking, which I'm not a big drinker. I wasn't a big drinker, but I started drinking because I just needed some something to just calm me down. I, God, I started drinking more than I can possibly imagine. It'd be nothing for me to, to drink a fifth, wash down with a couple other things, whatever I could find. And don't forget, I'm, I'm medicated also. So I'm on uh, a cocktail of an antidepressant and an anti-anxiety. And the anti-anxiety was Klonopin. And it says very clearly on the bottle, don't drink on Klonopin. I found out real quick that if you take a couple of Klonopin and drink, you can get twice as drunk with less alcohol. Scary thought. Don't, it's, it's really bad. It can have some, it can really hurt you. But at that point, I didn't really care. I was starting to think that I'm just becoming this monster and I'm, I'm starting to think that I don't belong here anymore. I'm supposed to be stronger than this. I was really mad at myself. I'm like, you're stronger than this, Kevin. You can do this. And I was out of control. Yelling at my wife, spitting at my wife, calling her every name in the book. She couldn't relate to me. I didn't stop sleeping in a bed because I was either, if I did sleep, I was having night terrors or I was so wet that when I woke up, I had to change the sheets. So I started sleeping downstairs. I can't live like this anymore. I, I need to go away. I need to remove myself from the situation. The common misperception with police is if I die while I'm working, I'll get, my wife will get three and a half times my salary. She'll get benefits for the rest of her life. I'm here to tell you that's not true. It's, it's one of the biggest farces and lies that we tell ourselves, along with that same lie that the world is better off without us. But I thought the world was better off without me. You're in a dark place. You just, it, it's, there's no rational thoughts. Trying to rationalize uh, suicidal thoughts is, is you're trying to ir rationalize an irrational behavior. So one morning, about 2 a.m., I walk into my office, which was just a converted bedroom. I take my my gun, which again, I never let my wife know that I was, I was holding this gun, I was carrying this gun. And this was the time that I was gonna remove myself from the situation, I was gonna kill myself. I write the note, I say goodbye to everybody. And in my note, uh, I'm just that type of guy where I don't wanna leave a mess behind. 
So I give passwords to the bank, you know, and, and things that need to be done, like a, you know, like a, a rundown list of everything that I take care of in the household, how the bills are paid, and, and I, I just, I'm ready to go, you know. I say, you know, tell my kids when I was older that I tried the best I could. I'm sorry that I'm such a disappointment. I'm sorry I turned into this person, um, but you don't deserve this. I still have that note. Um, I don't think I'll ever let anybody read it. I take the end of the gun and I can taste the metal on my tongue. I can feel the, the, the sight on my teeth. And it's a double action gun, so when you cock the hammer back, it's, it's, it's only, the, the gun itself is only 1.9 ounce or 1.9 pounds, something, somewhere around there. So it's real light, but it feels like it's, it's a lead weight in your hand. I could taste gunpowder on my tongue too. And I cock that hammer back and when you cock a hammer back, it's the slightest touch and boom, it's go time. And I replay the incident in my head. And I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm looking for a reason to not do this, but I can't find one. Nothing is coming to me. I'm just going through all the, the, the shit that I just put my family through. And this is, I'm probably four, or five weeks removed from the shooting. I'm not that same person. You can see it in my eyes. My whole body has changed. <sighs> Squeeze, I start squeezing the trigger tighter and tighter and tighter, just waiting for the bang. You know, because I, I figure in my mind, once that bang happens, it's just gonna be lights out. I'm not gonna see anything. I'm not gonna have to feel this pain anymore that I feel, this, this internal struggle, this emotional pain. <sighs> At the end, I have this brief moment of clarity. Uh, some people think it's their higher power calling. Some people think it's just a, a pause. I don't know. I don't know. I'd like to think that it's somebody telling me that I'm not done yet. I, I hold the gun in my hand and I just stare at it for probably 15 minutes going, oh my God. And I start thinking, now, now that moment of clarity let me think. I'm like, if I just did this, my kids are going to come down and find me. Find their father with their head, half their head missing, because I, I always had hollow point bullets. What a horrible thing to do. Yeah, that was, that was the first time that I tried to kill myself. Uh, other times, as I told you before, that if you take Klonopin and drink, it's a very dangerous cocktail. You can kill yourself. I knew this. So <laughs> I'm drinking all day because I can't work. I can't go, obviously, I'm never going back to the police department. I take a handful of Klonopin. I must have taken, I don't know, anywhere from 10 to 15, whatever, whatever I could pour out. And I start drinking and uh, just drink and drink and drink. And then everything, if you've ever passed out, you see the darkness just close in on you like this, you know, and you just pass out. Well, the downside of that was I woke up, and I woke up in a pretty bad mood because, once again, I was unsuccessful. Yeah. <sighs> there were other times, too. I, I tried to hang myself with a, uh, with a dog leash. At that, that time, I went out in the woods. Tried to drive, uh, you know, you're driving down the road, and you're just thinking, well, you know what, if I just fly off this bridge, that'll do it. Um, let me try that gun again. But the problem with the gun is, is I knew I was in trouble and I didn't want to do it, but I did not want to kill myself, but I, I found no other way. So I took my gun and I, I shipped it off to a friend of mine and say, Hey, look, you got to hold on to this. I'm, I can't be trusted with this stuff. And it just goes on and on like that. Just drinking and drinking and drinking. Um, just wondering how long I'm going to be able to do this. I started going to some group therapy and specifically with other officers. And there's something that I found out. I'm not the only one going through all these things. I'm not the only one that's having all these thoughts. There's other people involved that are, that, uh, other people who have been in similar incidents who are going through almost identical things that, that I'm going through. I can't, you know, I'm like, wow, this is, this is incredible. Um, and through that group therapy, I just, each day, you know, I, I would go to group therapy, come home, and I'd be able to sleep. 
I, I, you know, in, in six months' time, I probably slept a total of 24 hours. I started getting some help. I started getting some genuine help. And then I realized the biggest lie I ever told myself, as I said before, was the world's better off without me. Um, the world is not better off without me. Because as I got through this and got help from these other people, I realized that I'm not alone. Other people understand these feelings, where I thought nobody, nobody could understand these feelings. So I was on my way back. I was able to retire and get my pension, and thankfully, I was able to, to get my pension. And I realized once I was through, you have, an, you have a, a, an option once you retire. You could stop going to group therapy and say, hey, look, I'm cured, I'm fine. But if you were ever to do that, uh, you're, a, you're a fraud, you're a phony, because now you owe it to yourself to take what you've learned and pay it forward to other people and give what, you've, what people gave to you and pay it forward. Because those people don't want anything back. They want, it, they want you to, to go forward. So I continue going to group therapy and I see this, this cadre of people coming in and you can just see that look in their eye, their, that, that stare. You're like, yeah, you're, you're, about to, you're really about to go on this ride and there's nothing I can say. But what I can do is I can walk alongside of you from a place of understanding because I have been there and I made it out to the other side. See, when you're in the darkest times of your life, you're in this dark tunnel and you think there's nobody around you, nobody understands, you're all alone. It's not until you get towards the end where a little bit of light shines in and you look to your right and your left and there are people walking through with you and they're helping you out. It's just, it's so dark in there. And what I realized very quickly was what happened after this incident is no different than what happened in my childhood. I just ran away from my problems the same way I ran away from home and went to college, the same way I tried to change identities and run away from who I was before. That's all I was doing. But I was numbing it, alcohol, um, prescription medication, uh, trying, to, trying to kill myself. That was just a temporary fix. I had to face the problem. I had to turn around and hug this suffering of mine. And I did. I faced it head on. I had to go back and repair a lot of different relationships in my, wife, my life. I had to repair the relationship with my wife. I had to repair the relationship with my friend, with my, with my uh, children, with my friends who just thought I fell off the, the, the map. And I started to find some peace and hope when I went out there and, and started helping other people through the same situations that I went through. You know, we're, we're born with a, with a glass. And in that glass is the amount of suffering and pain and just crap that we can handle. And with each piece of pain that comes in, the glass gets a little fuller and a little fuller and a little fuller. And you hope that by the end of your life, that glass doesn't overflow because you hope that that glass was made big enough by your maker where you can handle all this stuff. My glass spilled over, my glass spilled over. I've learned to empty the glass now. So when the glass starts getting a little full, I just give that suffering a big hug. So I found a lot of peace and hope in helping others around me and helping people around me um, deal with their pain. Because as police officers and as, as just the, the regular citizen, you know, every piece of pain and damage we see, we, we stack on another piece of armor and another piece of armor and another piece of armor. And before you know it, after 20 years, you're so heavily laden with armor because these different pains, you don't ever want to get hurt like that again. So you guard yourself against it. You can't even stand up because you're so weighted down with armor. But when I started telling other people the journey that I went through, the pain that I went through, I found very quickly that a piece of armor will pop off. And wow, that feels pretty good. It's like doing a 20-year squat in a gym. You know, once that barbell comes off your back, you're pretty light. And that's what I did. I would go out and tell my story and tell my story. And somehow my story gave people some hope. And that identity that I was looking for, that thing that I was running away from, I seem to have found it in, in my new purpose is helping people, helping other people. Because that's ultimately, we're, we're on this earth once. We, we all have an expiration date. It's what we do when we're here that makes a difference. You know, everybody has peaks and valleys in their life. 
And just because you're high right now doesn't mean tomorrow you're not going to be in that valley. And then the next day you might be up again. I want everybody to realize that just because you're in a valley right now doesn't mean that you got to stay in a valley. And that there's purpose in your suffering. It's, a, it's about helping people through and showing them that there is purpose in this, in this life, purpose in their, in their pain and their suffering. You know, I, I, I learned to embrace my pain. And I use the, I use the terminology, uh, I read this book years ago, it was about how to survive worst case scenarios, and I think I was on a business trip or something. And one of them was a prairie fire. And now I'm in New Jersey, there's no prairie fires in New Jersey. But when you see a prairie fire coming to you, it's, it's human instinct to run away from danger. That's just how we're built, that's how we're designed, it's, it's survival. With a prairie fire though, if you run away from it, it's just gonna grow and grow and grow until it becomes so big that it's gonna consume you and you're ultimately gonna die. But all you had to do is run straight towards that prairie fire and you'll get through to the other side. You'll be a little scarred, you'll be a little charred, but ultimately you're gonna be alive. And we tell people, we walk people through to have them run th to their suffering, not away from it. Don't numb it, don't numb it. You would never know anything good in life if you didn't know the bad. And because you know the bad, in a way that some people can't imagine, you're going to have so much better perspective on the good things in life. You're, you're going to appreciate that meal a little bit more than the average person. You're going to appreciate your relationship with your kid or your spouse a little bit more than most people in life. And it's worked. It's really worked because then people will listen to it and say, you know what? I, I can relate to that person. So we're doing a group therapy session on air every week with thousands of people. And the, the Suffering Podcast is, has just been so great that I'm able to smile again. I, I went probably seven, six, seven years with rarely smiling and definitely very few genuine smiles. And now I have a genuine smile on my face. I'm a happy guy now. I found that primary identity. The one thing about primary identity, that thing that I was always, chase, always chasing, you know, primary identities have to be, my, my good friend, Pastor Adam Burt, primary identity, it has to be unshakable, and he's taught me this. I used to think my primary identity was being a tough guy, or being the, the, the best at sports, or being the biggest drug addict, or, or being uh, the best sport Play, or the, the, the highest educated person in college, or even being a cop. I always thought that was my identity. But all those things have an expiration date. Every single one of them has an expiration date. So you need to find something that is your primary identity, and only you can find it. Nobody can tell you what it is. You need to find your primary identity in something that's never going to move, whether it's a belief in your higher power or whether it's a belief in your children or your spouse, something that is, well, even your spouse is, is shakable. But you need to find something that is totally unshakable in your life. And then everything else you are falls underneath that primary identity. So when those things expire, you still have that one unshakable thing at the top. Helping others is where it's at, isn't it? Yo, it, that's all it is. That's what we're put on this earth to do. We're not put on this earth for personal gain. We're put on this earth to help our fellow human being. What a great talk, Kevin. Thank you. Thank you.